Type hints are great. I use them all over my code. I love them. I hate type hints. The uses in Python is extra work to write them. Most libraries don't have them. So why should I bother? And why do I have this whiny voice? It's like you have something against me. Person A is in favor of type hints and person B is against. Let's, let's call him Bernard. Person B has some good points. And there are more criticisms on using type hints, even by Guido himself, which I'll cover in a minute. I'm gonna talk about the issues with type hints and then I'll share the reasons why, in spite of all of those issues, I still use them all over the place in my code. After watching this video, I hope you'll have a better understanding of type hints and that it will help you make a decision about whether you should use type hints or not. And be like Bernard here. It's totally up to you. I don't wanna push you in any specific direction. Before we dive in, I have something for you. It's a free guide to help you with designing a new piece of software in seven steps. It's available at ariancodes.com slash design guide. It's a PDF file containing the steps that I take myself and hopefully this helps you avoid some of the mistakes I made in the past. If you enter your email address on the page, I'll send the guide to your inbox. ariancodes.com slash design guide. The link is also in the description of this video. So what are type hints? They're actually pretty specific to Python. Most typed programming languages need you to define types explicitly. For example, if you have a function or a method in a class, you need to specify the return type and the type of the arguments that you provide. Not all languages are like that. If a language is statically typed like C++, Java, C Sharp, and so on, then you need to provide types. In Python, this is not needed because Python is dynamically typed, but you can provide a type hint. And type hints are helpful for a couple of reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. Here I have a function called loon checksum that has no types at the moment, but we can actually add types to this function to make it a bit clearer what the arguments are of this function and what we expect this function to return. So if you look at the code, you see that it expects a number, but that's actually not a number, that's a string. Because you see that the digit of function, which is inside the loon checksum function, turns the number which is here, into a list of integers. So number is a string in this case. So we can add a string type hint to number, like so. And if you look at the return type of the function, you see that it computes a checksum, and then it returns whether that checksum modulo 10 equals zero. So that means that's a Boolean value. So let's also add the Boolean type here. So that's what you get when you add type hints. Digits of, we can also add type hints too. So number, that's still a string, but what's the return type? Well, that's a list of integers. And that's how we write this. Note that I'm using the lowercase list here to identify the type. This is in Python 3.10. In older Python versions, I think before 3.6, you need to import list with the uppercase L from the typing package, and then you can use that as a type hint. But in more recent versions, you can use lowercase list, and that also goes for the set and tuple and for dictionaries. By the way, if you're enjoying this video so far, give it a like. It helps promote this video to other people on YouTube. Thank you. Some criticisms of type hints that I commonly hear are, I don't see the benefit of using type hints in a duck type language, they've never helped me out. Benevolent dictator for life Guido was quite clear they never intend for types to be enforced in Python. Python will remain a dynamically typed language and the authors have no desire to ever make type hints mandatory even by convention. See PEP 484. Type hints artificially limit your code, especially more generic functions might work with a wider set of type than what you can specify. Think of sorting algorithms and so on. Not all libraries in Python have type hints. So why should I bother? It's extra work to add type hints to a Python program, but the interpreter ignores them. So what's the purpose? If you're testing your code already, why not simply add the test for type correctness as unit test? Now, despite all these criticisms, I still use types extensively in the code that I write. Why is this? I'm going to give you five reasons. The first reason is that types help me avoid write too much documentation. If you look at a Python function header that doesn't use type hints for its arguments, you need documentation in order to understand what you should provide to that function. And I really hate writing documentation. It's very easy to become outdated. You need to manually check that it's still correct. 
If code has too much documentation, it actually becomes harder to read. Now, to be clear, this doesn't mean the documentation isn't useful. If there's no documentation at all, you need to read the body of the function to understand what a function is doing. And that takes also a lot of time. Documentation is also helpful to clarify assumptions that a function makes about its argument or about the result it produces. In what cases the function will raise an error and so on. That being said, I'm all in favor of doing things to keep writing documentation, a basic simple task that I can do quickly. Types are a standardized way of specifying what an argument should look like and what kind of thing a function or method returns. Because it's a natural part of the function or method header, I find it's much easier and faster to read than putting those things in the function or methods documentation. It's a question of using the tools that are available to you to make your life easier. Reason number two is that types are helpful while writing code in your IDE. Your IDE can then detect sooner if you're passing the wrong kind of data structure, and it also provides autocomplete for data structures that it knows. In the PEP I mentioned in the beginning of the video, the authors also write this. This PEP aims to provide a standard syntax for type annotations, opening up Python code to easier static analysis and refactoring, potential runtime type checking, and perhaps in some context, code generation used utilizing type information. The first part of this in particular makes it easier for IDEs to use type information to help you better. The Loon checksum example shows how helpful it is to have these type hints. So in this case, this is the version without the type hints. So you might think, hey, I can call this with a number, right? But when you run this code, then you see we get an actual error that we're trying to iterate over an int object, which is not possible. The type hints clarified. So here's the version with the type hints that has the number as a string and the boolean. And we also put it inside the digits of function in loon checksum. Alternatively, what you could do is if you really don't want to supply type hints is to provide documentation. So here I have a version that has documentation and then you provide the parameters here and the return value and type here. So adding this documentation can be useful, but I do think it's quite long to also have to provide the parameters and the return type. And then the issue is you can still call this function with an integer and the IDE you won't complain at all. So you only discover the mistake once you run the program, if you actually run that part of the code, otherwise the program just runs fine without it. And there's an error hidden in your code somewhere. Here's the version of the function with type hints. So number is a string and returns a Boolean. If I call that function instead of the regular loon checksum without type hints, like so, now you see we actually get an error in the IDE that the types have a mismatch. This is one reason why I like type hints because they help me avoid errors while I'm writing the code and I don't have to wait until I actually run the code in order to detect these errors. And then of course, in this case, the easy way to fix this is to turn this into a string like so, and now I can also remove the oops because we don't need that. And then when I run this, you see that actually the result is true. So this was a valid credit card number, which is what the loon checksum is for. Now, of course, this is not a real credit card number. I'm not a lunatic. Was that a bad joke? That was a pretty bad joke. Okay, never mind. The third reason I use types is that it makes coupling more explicit. By using and sharing type definitions between modules, it's easier to see which modules are coupled to certain data structures. This is especially helpful if in the future you decide to change that data structure because then you want to know which modules are going to be affected. And those type definitions can take different shapes, from simple type hints for arguments passed to functions to complete protocol or abstract base classes. If you, let's say, rely on beautiful soup to parse HTML and your function expects a beautiful soup object, then it's useful to use type hint so that in the future, when you want to update the beautiful soup package to a new version, you know which areas of your code are going to be affected. Reason four is that using type hints forces you to be explicit about the data structures that you use. Having a clear idea of what the data looks like helps a lot when you design a piece of software. With types, you define this explicitly in the language. Types also discourage behavior that potentially leads to messy code, such as changing data structures on the fly, like dynamically adding attributes to an object, or creating data structures that are too large, leading to a loss of cohesion. If you define types before you write your code, what you're doing, in essence, is type-driven development. This is a good way to explain to your type checker how your data is going to be structured and how it's going to interact. Similar to test-driven development, you can then start writing your code around your types, 
until the IDE or your type checker stops complaining. Here I have a very simple function that checks whether somebody is eligible for a bonus. And that depends on the number of contracts landed, the hours worked, and whether it's family. If it's family, you're always eligible for a bonus. If you land contracts and you work more than 40 hours per week, you also get a bonus. This is a pretty simple function, so you can see that there's a problem in that it doesn't always return a value. But for more complex functions, that's hard to detect. And types can actually help you detect these things at an earlier stage. So at the moment, if you hover over the is eligible for bonus, you see that it actually detects that this function returns a literal true value or none. So that's one way to use types to discover that a function is not what you want it to be. Another way to do it is to actually specify a return type. So in this case, we want this function to return a Boolean value. So let me insert that here, like so. Now you can see that the function should return a Boolean value, but actually it returns none in some cases. So having the type helps us identify that there is an issue in the code. So we can of course fix that by simply changing this if statement here into a return statement like so, and then that we're going to remove. And now you see the type error is also gone. So you could approach type-driven development a bit similar in how you would approach unit test writing with test-driven development. So you first type your function with the argument types and the return type, and then you can fix the errors in the return type by actually coding the function. The fifth reason for me is that using type hints really simplifies your code. Often, untyped Python code has if statements in the function body to check that the argument you get is actually what you expect it to be. Types help reduce this kind of code. Though, to some extent, you might still need it, in particular if you're relying on data that you read from a file where you have no control over the structure. A better solution in this case is to rely on a validation tool, like Bydentic. You can then provide feedback to the user right after they try to import their crooked badly formatted data. Well, one remark related to type hints versus using unit tests. So instead of using type hints, you could also write unit tests to check that the data that is passed to a function does indeed follow what you expect it to be. In a language where type definitions aren't obligatory, like Python, this can make sense. But you lose out on all the advantages that I mentioned just now. And in addition, writing a type hint, in my opinion, is much faster than writing a bunch of unit tests. Especially for more complex data structures, this might become a lot of work. Type hints or using a type checker just means that you're adding an extra layer of checking your code's accuracy on top of what your IDE already does and what your tests already cover. Overall, my goal is to write my code as fast as possible. I want to get things done. Clarity of mind helps me do that. And I find that type hints have helped me a lot in providing that clarity. It makes me think about the structure of my data, it makes it easier for me to figure out what that function is supposed to do that I wrote a couple of months ago. And I can keep my unit tests focused on testing the actual behavior of my functions and methods instead of cluttering them up with type checks. That being said, if I write a script that I know is going to be really short, I'm going to throw away the code afterwards. I may not always use type hints either, but most of the time I will actually still use them. It's become a habit for me. It makes me feel like a complete person, as opposed to feeling like this guy, Bernard, over here. So don't be a Bernard, be an Arian. It's great to be on the A side. But even if you're using type hints, you still need to properly test your code though. And there's a lot of things to think about when writing unit tests. If you want to learn more about that, this video over here is a great start. Thanks for watching, take care, and see you next week.